I try to. You're back <clears throat> watching Ideas at Work and Beyond, and I've got Dr. Volpen Testa, a uh, well-established primary care physician uh, with a Bethel Medical Group in Bethel. <laughs> I forgot to mention that in the first part of our show. We had mic problems. <laughs> yeah, I know. We got them under control now, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, we're coming to you live from Comcast Studios, and uh, we've got a call in number 7924101, and hopefully it's on the screen. It is. And uh, you are more than welcome to call in and ask Dr. You know what? I'm going to come up with a new nickname for you. Dr. Red. Dr. Red. Dr. Red. Now, I, was gonna, well, you know, I was thinking more like Dr. V. V's good. That's yeah. what they call me. Yeah. So my patients call really? me. Really? Yeah. Dr. V. They don't always evolve and test yeah. it too long. Hey, yeah, because that, you know, Dr. Dr. Red, v. I'm thinking of that, that, yeah. that, that horse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mr. Red. Mr. Yeah, I've been Red, called yeah. that, too. <laughs> so, so we're going to back off of that. And, we'll see, and, you know, Dr. V's in the house. And if you've got questions about primary care or about health care, uh, give us a call. You know, uh, this guy's uh, this guy's like an encyclopedia of medical oh, knowledge. Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, and it's not too often that you can ask a doctor these questions without being billed. So <laughs> it's an opportunity. But anyways, uh, before the break, we yeah. were talking about uh, prescription drugs, and right. um, you had mentioned uh, during our break that there was uh, another way of doing it by by cutting the dosage down, or or right. Uh, how does that work? Yeah, let's say, and one of the big ones is with the uh, cholesterol drugs. Right. You know, there's 20, 40, 60, 80 milligrams, and blood pressure medicine too, Bob. Mm -hmm. And um, what we try to do is, uh, let's say you're on a dose, uh, the medicine for your blood pressure is, let's say, 20 milligrams a day. Right. And we may, to make it easier, we, we'll order you a 40 milligram pill. And most of the times they're scored. It means they have a little line down the middle, mm -hmm. and the patient can break it in half. And this... This significant, I don't know exactly how much, but there's, that's one way to save a little bit of money. And um, even with that medicine I was talking about, the hydrochlorothiazide, we, to start, we, you, there's a 25 milligram tablet. You can break it in half and take, make it a 12.5. So that's one way. That and using the generics, you know. And a lot of elderly people, people unfortunately, what they'll do, I mean, they'll miss drugs. I know they miss drugs. Yeah. They'll miss days. Don't forget. They'll forget, yeah. or they just can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So they'll try to get a month's worth of medicine and stretch it out maybe to six weeks. Right. That's unfortunate. That's a problem, yeah. Absolutely. But, We've uh, got uh, two phone calls. Let's, okay. Uh, let's do it in rapid fashion. All Ready? Right. Thank you for calling Ideas at Work and Beyond. Uh, what's your question for Dr. V? Yes. Hello, Dr. V. Um, oh, turn, on, turn on your TV. It's, it's too loud. It's feeding back. There you go. Okay. The doctor's in the house. Oh, yes. Hello, Dr. V. Hi. Um, Thanks for calling. Do you feel that people are more informed on medicine these days? And is that good for you or bad for you? How does it work for you if people are more informed? Well, that's a good question. Um, it can work both ways. I think it's better that they're uh, more informed because at least when they come into the office, we have more common ground to talk about. So more education, the better. Well, just like we're doing here tonight, I'm not an expert on all these issues, but, you know, I'm trying, you know, educating the public is where it's all, all you know, that's really where it's all about. Where is, so that's the good part. A little bit that you learn is good, gives us common ground. Where it's bad is sometimes I have a patient, and, and, and they're probably out there looking at this program now, who will come in to me and say, Doc, I picked this up on the net. On, on doc and MD net, and they'll come in with a like 25-page report of a disease that they have, and I take a big breath and I and I sit back in my chair and I say, <laughs> I go, oh, here we go, and I say, you probably know more about it than I do, and sometimes when you know too much, uh, it causes a lot of fear, unnecessary fear in the patient. Uh, for example, a lot of times people go to drugstore, and you know the drugstores now. When you buy a drug, they give you a sheet and it tells you all the possible bad effects of the drugs. Well, the truth is that those bad effects probably relate to just about any drug you can take. And, you know, they'll say, well, you, you, you know, you can get a rash or you, can, you feel tired or you feel dizzy. And so what happens is that the person who takes the new drug, anywhere along the line that they have any of those symptoms, they worry that it's the drug. Most often it's not the drug. So sometimes too much information is not good. 
So I think it sort of balances out. And you should just bring, it, bring, that, bring those questions to your doctor and work it out with him or her. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Uh, next caller. Ready? Ready. Thank you for calling. You're, uh, you're in the house with Dr. V here. Hello, Dr. V. Hello, everyone. Uh, by the way, great discussion. Uh, oh, we good. should bring these issues to the forefront more often. Thank you. Doctor, uh, I had a question for you. I know you're a prominent doctor in the area here, and you've been practicing for a number of years. And I wanted to hear a bit as to how you have noticed the, uh, the, just the volume of patients coming into the office and the number of patients being seen by doctors every single day. For example, my wife sees a regular doctor. She has a chronic disease. And every time we see you go to the doctor, it seems it's five, it's four minutes. Sometimes you don't get to see the doctor. And it's very fast-paced. Every 15 minutes is an appointment. And it seems like doctors are losing touch with what's really happening with the patient sometimes. Doctors have to review the file every single time. I like the old days where doctor would know patients more closely and have more uh, better understanding, sometimes more up-to-date knowledge of what's happening. And I feel like the medical practice is getting so bureaucratic, especially in doctors' offices. You call in, you can't get a hold of anyone. So many patients being seen. Do you think the reason for that is because doctors have to basically increase their income in order to pay the medical malpractice insurance? Or do you think it's just a matter of having an outside agency control or regulate the number or doctor schedules, uh, the number of patients they can see every day? Because that not only affects the quality of care being given by, to each patient, but also a doctor is physically able to do this every single day and perform at their best when evaluating every patient. So I wanted to hear your opinion on that, and thank you very much for your, yeah. um, you know, all your information today and all the expertise you're sharing with the public. Thank so you, good night. Thank you. Yeah, that's a super question. I mean, you, you're really striking at the soul of what's... Uh, the malaise that has really spread over our profession. Um, two things there that you, uh, you brought out. One is that there's no doubt that, as we said before, because of HMOs regulating doctors' fees, doctors have to see more patients to survive. I mean, I periodically call up primary care doctors in our area and I say, hey, how you doing? How you making out? You guys surviving? You and everybody, t uh, particularly with the primary care people, they'll tell me, I don't know how much longer we're going to, you know, we're overwhelmed. I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to do this. So there's no doubt that the regulation of the fees forces the doctors to see more patients. And so as you see more patients, you spend less time with each patient. And so what happens? So you go to the doctor and you feel, well, you feel taken advantage of. You'd like to maybe talk 10 or 15 minutes and maybe you get half of that or even less. So that is uh, one issue, there's no doubt about it. About paying the malpractice and insurance, yeah, that, that's, you know, that's one of the factors that, that feeds into, the, into the, the, the necessity to see more patients and, and to see them quicker. So I, I think you answered really both of your questions. The regulation of fees and the uh, malpractice insurance is one of them. And it's just more expensive these days to uh, to, to, to run a practice. The call, caller had um, a very interesting point, yeah. and, that, and that was a third part of his question, and that is this. The fees are being regulated. Right. Why aren't they regulating the amount of patients you can see? Because here's, you know, uh, before you get, uh, before you think it's, it's the wrong question. It's not the wrong question. But I think you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. In other words, is it fair for them to regulate your fees and force you to have to denigrate the quality of care by seeing 30 patients a day? Or is it a lot more fair if, if you're gonna regulate fees, then don't expect me to see 30 people, you know what I mean? Yep. I can only see 15 people. That way you kill two birds with one stone. Yes, yeah, absolutely, Bob. We got and, another and caller. And uh, I've, okay, well, I've written about that. And, you know, okay, we'll you know go We'll, we'll, we'll take handle this and we'll right. try and get back okay. to it, okay? All Here right. we go. Hello, thank you for calling. You're in the house with Dr. V. Hey, go Air Force. Hey, listen, doctor, I have a question in three parts for you. I did an overseas long tour in England in the European and African theater during the Cold War, and wow. uh, I, um, I ran into some uh, doctors over there, and uh, I thought their uh, system in England wasn't that bad. You know, it was socialized medicine. 
uh, people did get their immediately uh, immediate needs taken care of. But again, if you wanted a facelift or nose job, you had to wait. That's the first part. The second part is um, that um, there is R and D over there. One caller pointed out that there isn't, but there is R and D program. Um, and the other thing is the VA does a very good job controlling costs of medicine in this country, but the private sector doesn't. And uh, have you ever run across any data, like for for which states, like I know Maine has a health care system, so there's some states in the union that have health care. So you might want to look at data, you know, from that and uh, consider that because I tell you, there's systems in this country that do work. Anyway, I'm going to yeah. listen off the air and thank you and good show. Yeah. Thank you, caller. Boy, well, these these, these are good questions. Are yeah, and, and it goes to show you that the public is uh, – is, is attuned. I mean, these are all deep, insightful questions, Bobby. First of all, about the uh, cost and different, uh, if I understood them right. Uh, yeah, they, they've looked at these costs. I'll mention a few cities, but I'm not sure about this, but, but the idea is correct. Like, they'll say if you get a bypass surgery in, uh, let's say, Miami, it may cost you twice as much or, uh, you know, 180 percent as much as a bypass surgery in uh, Seattle, Washington. Those are just examples. And they're not sure what, you know, they're not sure why. So they're, they're doing studies about it. Why is it cheaper to get your gallbladder out in uh, Montana than it is in Alabama, you know? I, I, I don't know why. It probably has something to do with uh, uh, the price of malpractice insurance in the various uh, states and, uh, you know, how much it costs to, for a physician to run his office maybe cheaper to run his office in Alabama than it, than it is, let's say, in Seattle. So I don't know if that answers the question, but there's uh, – people are looking at that. I don't have a great answer for it, but they are looking at it. There are regional differences, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. The caller mentioned that in Maine. In Maine. They apparently have their own health care system. Well, and yeah. I'm so, sort of aware of that uh, because I'm involved right. a little bit uh, in, in the patient satisfaction side of it. Um, right. Right. Company and uh, okay. Maine does have have some sort of a, a, a special yeah. program. I, I I don't know anything about it, but right. I guess the point he's trying to make here is that frankly, he's been exposed to other healthcare systems yeah. in foreign countries, right. and <clears throat> you know we started the show by talking about how, how all healthcare is local, and it's really it's a very personal thing. Absolutely. You know, I mean, how do you judge value whether you're getting quality healthcare? Well, it's it's a one-on-one -on -one experience. It is. It, it, it's not something that. That, that you breathe. It's right. not a universal thing in that sense. It's a, how does it impact you? Do you personally feel, you know, does the patient feel that they're getting quality care? Well, along those lines, if a patient has a primary care doctor that spends 15 to 20 or 30 minutes yeah. with them on a call, on a visit, just as they did in the old-fashioned days, that person probably feels like they're getting a lot more quality, quality. care than one of these callers that uh, mentions that Every time they go to the doctor's office, it's basically a turnstile, yeah. and, and it's basically a yes. three- or four-minute visit. Yeah. And how can that possibly right. feel like quality care? Even, even, you know, no matter how good the technology is, Absolutely. No, no matter how good your health care package is, everything could be paid for. Right. If your visit, if your experience with a doctor is down at three or four or five minutes yeah. and you're waiting for an hour, then there's something wrong on that level, too. And I, and I know that's an issue for you. Oh, it is. Um, and, I mean, you're and, talking about the soul of medicine again. Right. You see, yeah. the philosophy of medicine, and I've written about this. There's no doubt about it that, um, you know, before you had asked Bob, uh, gee, you know, shouldn't there be some rule on how many patients you could see? Right. We got back to that, right. Yeah, I mean, that's important. I mean, yeah. you know, should you be proud because you're seeing 50 patients a day? Does that make you, wow, a super doctor? Mm -hmm. I don't think it does. I mean, there is, and, and, and there are some studies that are coming out on that, by the way. Um, the American Academy of Family Practice, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, they're saying somewhere between 18 and 20 patients a day is really the maximum that a physician should see. The trick is, how do you do that and survive? You either have to lower your living standards, which is one part, you know, you don't get your Mercedes Benz, you drive your Ford Taurus, and you live in a, you know, you live in a, Lesser, a less expensive home. Right. So you know that's one way of getting uh, getting around. And you, you, you just, it's a, 
it's a personal decision. I mean, let me make an analogy. And, yeah, and and you might appreciate this. In the auto body industry, yeah. if you wreck your car, you go in and they have a chart. The insurance companies basically say, listen, it's, it's going to cost two hours of labor to fix the fender, right. an hour to replace the glass, you know, an hour and a half uh, yeah. uh, to, to uh, re redo the front grille. Yeah. The, does that system exist with the HMOs? Do they have a system where the doctors, where, where they basically tell you, listen, We'll pay you X amount of dollars for this type, this type of treatment, and we expect it to, you know, basically last 15 or 20 minutes. Is there a, a time allotment to it? Because if I, there was, yeah. it'd be a fair system. I mean, if basically, if they're saying, if the HMOs that you guys have to live with basically say, listen, we don't want you to see more than 15 patients a day. They never say that. Oh, why not? Yeah. Why wouldn't they? They want you to see as many patients as possible, or? Well, I, I think they push you to see. Well, I mean, well, oh, getting, oh, I see what you're saying. We're yeah. getting into Would an they, interesting area here. Yeah, now. yeah. No, well, this is the philosophy of medicine. You're absolutely right. You have to see. If you see too many, you can't be a good physician. And how do you mention quality? You know, how do you how do you describe quality? This is this is how I want to get into that, Bob. Right. You got two doctors, Doctor A, Doctor B. Right. This doctor's seen 50 patients today. This one is seeing 20. As far as the AMA, as far as the the HMO goes, you're both equal, because the patient doesn't tell the HMO, Bob's only giving me two minutes, Ed's giving me 15, and like I get some kind of bonus for being a better physician. Right. You can be a good physician, and a mediocre physician. And the HMO puts you both in the same category. You see, they. They, they make it faceless. Wow. They take the face away from the physician. Listen, years ago, we used to be called doctors. Now we're called healthcare providers. It takes your face away. You know, it's like in a totalitarian government. You know, you, you get rid of religion, you can't believe in God, right. and then you can do whatever you want with the people. And that's what they've done to medicine. But well, who suffers there? The patient suffers. The patient suffers there. You know, yeah, start calling us uh, primary, you know, providers. So you see, right away, you're taking away the spirit, the soul out of medicine, even taking away you. patients are becoming, uh, what do they call them? Healthcare consumers. <laughs> you're not even a patient anymore. You're a consumer and I'm a provider. It's a fast food thing? Fast food. That's yeah. fine if you're making toasters or right. automobiles, yeah. but not when you're dealing with people. And every patient is different. You can have five people with high blood pressure. Right. And you treat each one differently. Mm -hmm. But the HMO has what they call guidelines, and they, they like you to cookie cut them because that makes it easier. Right. And it's wrong. And that's why you, you lose that one on one. After a while, you, even the patient becomes faceless. And that's a, that's a tragedy. They're ignoring the, the humanity of it, really. Yeah. yeah, and we don't talk about that, Bob. We, you know, the, what you're doing here is not talked about on national TV. No, what you're doing here is... Well, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, you're the prime mover. I mean, no, I was no. listening to TV the other day, and they had one of the presidential contenders, and they were talking for 25 minutes about stem cell research. I mean, that's such a complicated, sophisticated... People don't want to know about stem cell research. They want to know, why can't I get a doctor to see me for my earache, right. my sore throat, and my bellyache? Yeah. And uh, you were mentioning universal care before. There are, and you were saying, well, it's going to have to begin in a fragmented way, which is true. By the way, California, Pennsylvania, uh, Maine, and uh, Massachusetts mm -hmm. are experimenting. And the joke is, up there in Massachusetts, Romney has got this, uh, Mitt Romney's got this, um, uh, pro you know, uh, initiative to, they're, Taking money, they're asking the employers to donate to a fund mm -hmm. to uh, provide primary care for everybody. But they, they can't find enough primary care doctors to take care of the patients. We'll tackle that as soon as we tackle right. this call. Thank you for calling. You're in the house with Dr. V. Uh, yes, I have a question for Dr. V. All right. I'd like to know when and why did HMOs come into being? Oh, right. That started back in the... Um, Late 60s, uh, uh, employers who were paying for health care started to see that, wow, if we make an automobile, you know, eight, nine hundred, a thousand dollars of that cost of that health of that automobile is being consumed by uh, health care insurance. So there was a actually it was a physician and a um, and a health care economist. The physician I think was from Massachusetts and the 
the professor was from California, and somehow they uh, they convinced President Nixon to uh, of this new concept called managed care, also called you know what you know as HMO, health okay uh, health maintenance organization, mm -hmm. and then it just took off. It was sold to the public as a vehicle for controlling cost. And in the beginning, in the early 90s, when it really took over in our area, in most of the United States, it did control costs for a little while. We had double-digit inflate. Uh, Health care was going up 8, you know, 12, 14, 15 percent of a year. And it did bring it down for a few years. But now it's right back up to where it, where it was. So it hasn't lived up to its promises. And uh, don't forget, you know, uh, managed care, HMOs, they have shareholders that they're responsible for. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know they, they pay for your health care, but their real um, responsibility is to stay competitive is to generate profits. And they do that by control, regulating doctor's fees, hospital's fees, visiting, you know, uh, nursing home fees, and um, raising your premiums. The system is out of balance. It's, it's, it's broken. Everybody knows that. I, I even think the people who run the HMOs know that. Let me end this show. We got a couple of minutes left. Um, we, need, we need about three more hours, Bob. Well, we'll, we'll, yeah. maybe, we'll do it again. Maybe four. <laughs> With a little bit of uh, uh, help from Ivan, we'll, he'll yeah. let us back on, yeah. and, and you'll go at it again. But let's end the show on an interesting note. Good. If someone wants a primary care physician, okay, what are the, the options? Because I know there is a shortage of primary care clinics and physicians in this area. For example, I'm new in town and I need a primary care physician. Can I call you up? I, I just saw you on the show. I love your attitude. You got a bedside manner. That's great. You know, it's like my, it, it, it's like a doctor I had 40 years ago. Can I call you up and, uh, and, and uh, become a patient of yours? Uh, What's the probably, reality? Well, you know, you put me on the spot. Well, not just you. No, but no, but you're right. No, but you're right. No, yeah, it's good. Listen, I'll tell you, I remember 30 years ago when I came to yeah. Bethel, they invited me to a, a yeah. garden club meeting, and right. people were in the audience, and they were really getting mad. They were saying, you know, I, I called you up two weeks ago, and I can't get an appointment. I'm somebody I had no responsibility right. yeah. for. I said, I'm sorry, I'm just too busy. And they were really mad. Right. You know, they just expected if yeah. I call you up, I'm going to get an appointment. You know, you're going to be yeah. my doctor. I mean, right now, my pra I mean, I very rarely, you know. You've got 30 seconds. <laughs> I mean, if somebody has a family member, yeah. listen, would you take care of my grandpa or my son? I fit mm -hmm. them in. But no, my doors are not opened, uh, wide open anymore to take on new patients. No. But that's true for not just you. That's for many true primary, for many primary kids. There's not enough of us around. So right. that's why we're using PAs right. in the uh, advanced mm -hmm. practice nurses. And that's why we talked about retail clinics, and they're here to stay. Folks, I hope you enjoyed you yourself. <laughs> Dr. V, you've been great as always. Have a good night. We'll, we'll be doing this again in the future. Thank you, and have a great night. <sighs>